So yeah. thank you, people, uh, folks who've joined. Uh, my name is Gonzalo, and um, I want to thank everybody for joining this live webinar. Today, we have a great guest speaker for you folks. Um, so kind of a little bit of background information on, on who we are. We're AMG Mastermind. We're a group of uh, like-minded individuals, um, uh, very much interested in real estate and investing, and we just have that entrepreneurship uh, passion inside all of us. So we like to host these monthly webinars, bring in some uh, amazing guests onto these webinars, and hopefully uh, share some value uh, for, for our guests and, and our viewers and our listeners. Now, um, before I hand it over to Mark Weiss and make a formal introduction to, uh, to Jason, um, I, wanted to, I felt it was a good, a good segue to uh, obviously folks here on this call who have goals and really the importance of you know, not quitting on those goals and trying to kind of make it all the way to reach those goals. So um, Jason uh, recently completed a 100 mile pretty much loop. Uh, I believe it was five 20, 21 mile loops around his neighborhood within a 24 hour period. Uh, I, 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 and congratulations, Jason, man. I, when I first heard about that, I was like, wow, great accomplishment. Um, like hundred miles. You know, hundred miles. 100 miles in a 24 hour period. Exactly. So for you folks out there who kind of, you know, try to fit in running into your daily schedule, myself, 10 or 15 miles, I mean, is, is a huge accomplishment in one day, right? And let alone uh, people who've done marathons. Jason did five of them, or four of them, I'm sorry, in, in one day. Now, Jason, my question to you, man, is uh, I want you to kind of paint a picture for us. Mile 95, man, where, where, where were you mentally? Where was your mindset at? Your body, you know, you were exhausted. You were dehydrated. You were hungry. You had blisters all over your foot. No matter how much tape you put on there, right? It, it didn't matter. Blisters all over the place. How did you how did you make it, man? Uh, I mean, where were you at at that point? What made you not give up, not pretty much pick up the phone, call Peely up and say, hey, come pick me up. I'm done. Ninety five miles. Good enough for the day. Right. Um, give us give us tell us where you were at that point, man. At mile ninety five mentally mindset. What made you not give up and, and make it to the finish line? I'll take your answer and then hand it over to Mark. Sure. So appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me. And honestly, if I called Peely at where that would have been midnight with three little kids sleeping, she she would have not come to get me. So so at that part, sometimes it's that thing that you're just gonna do it right. When when you you just like anything, right? There there's mental battles and physical battles. And after a while, the physical battle, you think it's your body that wants to stop, but it's really your mind. And so many times we'll stop when really our our body's fine, but our mind's telling us that that you you know you you did good enough. So it is still okay. So you did that. You did that mile and a half. That's cool. Even though you could have done two, but you did that mile and a half and you think you should stop. Well, that's the same thing with running, right? And you, you have to set it where like, when you do marathon training, you, you, you'll do a progression. You know, you'll, you'll build yourself up. So you'll, you'll do some ones and twos and three miles the first week. You know, then you'll get up to like tens and twelves and like the tenth or twelfth week. And then you'll build yourself up to 20 miles and, and 22 miles before you run the marathon. Well, when you run 100 mile races, it's not like I'm out there running 80 mile preparation races. Right. So it becomes a battle of the mind, just preparing your mind to know that you're just going to plow through because there's going to be ups and downs just like anything right there you're going to have the best of times and then in the next mile your, your mind's going to be just in the gutter right so these are always the races the first 50 miles is all body this last 50 miles is all mind and what had happened is over these five loops i i had planned it out at 20 miles i actually hadn't run it um i I drove it one time and I came out a little bit higher on like 22, but I figured it just was uh, just the way we were driving, but it actually ended up being about 21 miles. So had some guys running with me um, throughout the day, you know, some at 5 a.m. for the first, you know, 15, 20 miles. And I had some other guys at like 50, between 50 and 80, 84. Um, but those last 16 miles were on me, right? And when you get to those last 16 miles, it the the things that were out of normal from a race, it was like, now I, I had to set the loop. I was setting my nutrition, I was setting the pace, and I was now running a foreign loop because I wasn't running my traditional 20 or the, the prepared loop because I just needed to do that that final 16 miles. And to couple of that, it, it was getting cold. And a, I had done this on another prior 100 mile race where I said dress warmer and I didn't. Same thing here. I put on what was warmer clothes, but you know, a, a, an hour into my last loop there, I was freezing. But that's just where you, you tell yourself you're done. Like, I'm done with this race. I'm finishing this race. It's already done. I just have to get to the end. That's it. 
it's already done in my mind. And when you set your pace, it doesn't matter. You just you just figure out that not everything's going to go purpose, but perfect, but it is going to get done. And that's pretty much any goal, any scenario. And when you set parameters where you say, okay, here's the big goal. But right now, if I was to start at 5 a.m. and say, okay, I'm going to run 100 miles, that, that, that's so overwhelming for the mind. It's like if you were sitting here on a call today, like, I'm going to be a billionaire. Well, since you've never been a billionaire, it's so overwhelming for the mind. But if your first thought was like today, I'm going to reach out to five highly successful people and ask them if they were in my position, what was the first thing I could do? Well, that can lead you to be a billionaire. And that's the same thing with running a hundred mile race. I, you think of it, okay, I just got to get through that first lap. Then I got to get through that second lap. Then I have to get the next thousand feet. Then I just need to make it to the tree. Then I just have to make it to, to the street sign. Then I just have to run 500 steps. Then I just have to run another 200 steps. Then I just have to get up the hill. And next thing you know, there's a hundred miles. It wasn't a hundred miles. It was a hundred miles over many battles, many, many accomplishments, many wins. And that's how we try and really set up our day. It's, it's stacking wins. Wins could be getting up at 4 a.m. and beating the sun up. Wins could be having breakfast with my kids. Wins could be making those three calls. Wins could be anything. But when you start stacking those wins, you look back and the big one is easier to reach because all, now you've already had all these little wins. So you've built it into your mind. And it goes so much in terms of, success and failure is people may be so unhappy with where they where they are but they'll 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 make the choice to stay there because the the they're so scared of the, of the success because they've never had it so it's more fearful of, of of something that because it's unknown than to stay in a place even if it's something that makes them so unhappy and then so we trend back to average but the same thing here i could have stopped a million times right i could have stopped uh, just for whatever reason a hundred times but when you do that it just says, do I really need to stop? Is, is, that, is that what I need to do right now? Or am I telling myself that? Or, am I, or is there some reason I need to stop right now? And that's pretty much like your goal, right? Do you need, is there something that's physically gonna, gonna hurt you? Is there something that's really gonna set you back? Is the worst case scenario you're thinking of actually gonna happen if you go forward and try that? Probably 90, 95% of the time, the answer is no. It's just that we're setting the, the story in our head we're letting our mind play out where we think the worst thing is going to go because we're acting in, in a fight or flight nature. And when you go through life in that fight or flight nature, we're always living in this thing of scarcity, right? We're not living in abundance because we're, we're treating ourselves as we can't accomplish something because, you know, it, it, we, we don't think it, it's within us because the biggest battle we ever have is our mind. That's it. It's first and foremost. No matter where you think, there's nobody holding you back except your mind's your first barrier you have to get over. Once you start stacking wins in your mind, your mind says, okay, we're doing this. And then that leads you to whatever step you want to take, whether it be a hundred or something else. So that, that race that day, um, I, in all honesty, it wasn't that bad. I mean, I got up and worked out the next day because I was set. Wow. I was so ready that I was just like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm just done. Mm -hmm. And you really knew it. Like she was like, you know, you, you, you she, on tape, she was just like, okay, it's already done. Just see you later. And I was just part of it, you know, and, and it just, it's doing things throughout the day that you just, you know, you have to do, right. Um, I burned something like 17,000 calories that day. So I was eating, did not want to eat, but I knew I had to eat because if I didn't eat. It was going to be painful for me later. So it's like those things that like, I didn't want to eat anymore, but I, I had to do that because that's what it took to accomplish my goal. That is wow. amazing. 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 Thank well, you. As you can tell, um, you know, Jason is a very dynamic, very inspirational person. So, um, you know, we probably put the cart before the horse in terms of uh, asking the question and then introducing him. But um, as you can tell, he's very, very uh, motivational and, and, you know, very driven uh, individual. He's a, a mentor to uh, myself and Gonzalo and a personal friend of ours. Um, Jason is a nationally acclaimed syndicator, uh, has over uh, 750 units under management by now, probably, I guess, more since having done some recent deals. He's um, killing it this year. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> podcast co-host of the Jason and Pilly Project. Uh, definitely want to give that a sub subscription if you guys um, really enjoyed that last uh, little bit, um, which sets the foundation for building mental fortitude, growing wealth, and improving health by providing actionable steps that – Jason Peely and their guests have taken along the journey. He's also the host and founder of New Jersey's multifamily formula meetup, which to my knowledge, Jason, I could be off with this, but I think it's the largest New Jersey based uh, multifamily meetup with uh, over 2000. Oh, members. Yeah. Certainly in the running uh, ultra marathoner, as we said, um, 
And perhaps uh, last, but definitely not least, probably most importantly, husband to Pili Rusi and father to three beautiful kiddos. So um, with that, I'll leave it up to you to uh, take it from here, Jason. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you. This is a lot of fun. I'm psyched to be here tonight. And of course, we're going to dive in on asset management. And uh, this is a topic that really helped us scale. And we're excited to talk to everybody else on, on point here. And now, to set the stage here a bit is that um, they gave us a great intro here. Just back in 2016, um, we were working a family business in construction and we wanted to make the transition because, you know, we, we had our, our first son, we were having our second daughter and we were really active at our construction company and we were doing flipping, wholesaling and a lot of other active roles that were just leading us away from our goal, right? It, it's, it's one thing to be busy. But it's another thing to be to, to be busy enough, feel like you're effective or aiming towards your goals. So we were looking for that angle, right? And we we like we said, started flipping, started doing a lot of real estate things that we thought were the direction. What we were learning very quickly were just adding complexity to our day and our life, and taking us further away from being able to set our day and closer to just having more chaos that was really pulling us out of control. So we found someone that was investing in small rental properties out of state. And they were doing this by, by, they had a management company out there, they had contractors up there and they were buying these single family homes and they were buying them basically in disrepair, fixing them up, getting them written out, rinse and repeat, pulling their money out. And it was just something that it, about that that we, we saw and we, we just mentally were like, this is something we could do with our management skills and get actively involved. So I flew out to the market um, it wasn't the worst area. It wasn't the best area, but I, at that point I was so raw in my, um, due diligence. I was like, well, the, the mailman, I saw the mailman going home on the block. I was like, well, if the mailman's living there, how bad could this street be? Right. But that was my first start just in learning what was there. Um, so we brought some two, uh, some duplexes, some two families, some three families, some four families, and just started really repeating that model because we saw someone else doing it effectively. And we just said, okay, what's that person doing? How can we follow that model and rinse and repeat? And that worked amazing, right? So we, we saw that and we said, this is great, but this is going to be hard to grow. I mean, how are we going to get up to the point where we're going to have enough cash flow from these, where it's going to be really beneficial be, without trying to buy a, a 52 families or, or 20 quads? And it just got too complex of, of, a, of a web that we said, well, what else could there be instead of having all these two families over town? So we saw someone that was buying apartment buildings. And this was that moment that, you know, they clicked for you. You said, well, wow, if, if, if we're just buying these and we want to get up to 50 or 100 units, well, why can't we just buy that one building? And it was that moment where you said, hmm, who else is doing it successfully? And we found people that were just doing that model saw what they were doing, asked questions, and then just started replicating the model, started replicating what they were doing. That led us from sell, basically having those twos, those threes and fours, selling them and going straight from there into buying a 94 unit, um, really about a year later. But it was all that we, we set our mind, we set the narrative and we looked at that first step, just like when you were running a race, what's that first step? What's that first actual step we had to take? And a lot of the, the business we do today is being actively involved finding communities, seeing what the community is currently doing and how can we make this a better place to live? And when you think about that, you say, okay, well, well what does that do, right? Well, if you're looking for a community that's underperforming and it could be the property itself, could be the management, or it could be a combination of both. And you say, okay, how can we make this a better place to live? Because if we make this a better place to live, it's going to make the tenant base better. It's going to make the tenant base happier. It's going to make a better performing building that's going to um, perform better. So it's going to lower expenses. So ultimately, you're going to have tenants that are happy where they live, that will pay more rent because the building's being taken care of better. That's what can bring in more better income in that's going to help our investors uh, benefit more. That's going to lead to us benefiting more. So we always look at that point of, of it's like any business. If we were going into a restaurant and saying, we want to buy this restaurant and, you know, why isn't this restaurant performing? Oh, you know, I walked up to the hostess stand and nobody came 20 minutes. Well, it's the same thing as an apartment building, right? If you're, they have a leasing office and you call 10 times and nobody picks up the phone, you leave five messages and nobody gets back to you. You go and try and visit the office and they're only there two hours a week. 
Okay, so all we would have to do is provide better service to, to offer opportunities for people to lease the property. So we're looking for properties that are not performing, that are not performing well, that we can come in there, reposition them to perform better. And when you think of it like that, it's, it's as simple as that. Why is it not performing well? Where can we come in to curve that edge and make it a better performing property so it's a better community to live? And that goes into asset management. How do we produce massive results with great asset management? So you, Mark, Mark spoke a little bit about the us, so won't jump out to us. Um, I actually have to, this is a little dated so on some of these things, but we've done a lot. So at this point, uh, this is probably, man, I'd run a couple hundred miles from here. So 50 mile, one mile race. So even from there, 51 mile to the hundred mile, right? Well, that leads you to the point here where you just choose the next goal and you find the next step to get there. Um, I do have two bulldogs. So right now you got my wife, three kids and two bulldogs because I'm working from the home office being quiet, which is a, uh, incredible so something's going on all right so what is asset management now the asset management monitors the economic performance of the property and creates and oversees and monitor, monitors work for flows of the property and monitors the management company of the property so you, you you may think of property management well asset management is not property management it oversees the process of the property from acquisition to disposition, but it's not the active manager of the property. And it's aiming to achieve the goals and objectives of the owners and investors. Now, this role can be the owner and or and also someone who invests in a property. In many cases, I am asset management on our property and I am the ownership, the general partnership on the property. But my role within the general partnership is to act as asset management. Again, is this property management? No. Uh, the property manager handles the day-to-day -day operation of the property, working to achieve the plans of the and plans and goals. So here, the owner process is uh, aiming to achieve the goals, objectives for owners and investors. And same thing here is asset management is also working with them to provide guidance on those goals. So we're providing guidance. We're providing and pushing forward the plan and property management is implementing the plan. So it's a symbiotic relationship, but the important thing to note here is why it's so important to find the right property management companies because if we have the best plan, but we don't have the property management company that can implement that plan, then it's gonna be all for naught. And on the contrary, if we feel we have a great plan, but we're working with a dynamic property management company who says, listen, understand what you're, you're trying to do here, that will not work for these reasons. We should pivot and try this. That can be massively valuable to you and your apartment community. You don't want to go in there and separate uh, separate and meter units in an area where it won't be accepted. Uh, there's actually one of the buildings we brought originally across the street. An owner, he took the building and he separately metered the units. Well, it turned out that he was a smaller property and the largest property in that area uh, paid water for the tenants. He refused to do a bill back system. So what happened here is tenants would not pay their water bill. The tenants that this gentleman had after he paid the couple thousand dollars to, to, to separately meet the units, they'd pay the rent, but ultimately they would not pay for water. So he had to make a choice. Like, do, I, do I evict people because they're not paying the water? Well, what he did is he actually had that cost go out front to separately meet the units and ended up going back and now again pays the water. So you always have to look at how your building's performing and how it can be performing in other areas. Um, he was managing a property himself, so he made a um, he made a decision that he tried something without really doing his homework, and and it bit him. Um, so little things like that to have the right team in place that can guide you is massively important. So some of the parts of planning, of course, your property inspections uh, that can be ongoing, can be pre pre uh, take over the property. Um, we have a property under contract in uh, in Murfreesboro, Nashville, um, MSA right now. So we just went through property inspections. We're also in the planning and budgeting and takeover plan. Now we're working on that right now actively with the management company there to really put forth what's going to be the best plan. What's going to be the best plan coming into, uh, you know, winter months, holiday months. Uh, we, we're looking, of course, at what renovation should we be doing from a CapEx uh, perspective. Of course, weather is not as harsh as we may have here in New Jersey. So we're going to be able to focus focus on some of the exterior CapEx projects to start, but we also have to look at the tenant base. The tenant base, there's a lot of uh, weekly and monthly renters. So when you look at that, okay, 
do we really want to push really bullish on a repositioning plan at first with the tenant base, noting that we're going to take over in the middle of November, coming right into the holidays? Because will this property perform over those holiday months? Does this market um, sometimes lag over those holiday months? You see it in other markets. How would that um, how would that happen here? So we talk with management company and make sure the plan we're putting in place is going to benefit the property in the long run. We're also going to be working with owner objectives and loan requirements. So that could be a many parts. It could be um, there anything on the front end from helping to attain the loan to, to throughout the property, providing financial statements that the uh, the lender may require every every quarter to uh, filling out for for um, draws on anything from uh, capex holdback to reserve holdback. Operations. Uh, so this is a constant part right here that you. It's not a set it and forget it property. There, there is a few things that if you are doing a repositioning play in a value add multifamily property where it's set it and forget it. So the operation side of asset management is key. The way we that implement this is that we make sure we have our checks and balances. We have weekly calls with our property management companies. We have weekly reports that we designate that we have coming over for property management company. And right now uh, we have almost a, uh, I think it's bi-weekly we're receiving collections noting we're in, uh, in, in, in some form still in, in the COVID uncertainty. So we're just making sure that we're constantly in front of it. So operations is a massive point right here that we're looking at all points to make sure that the the building is performing as it should, and we can catch anything early. So if something's happening early, we can basically plan to pivot as quickly as possible. These are large apartment buildings. Sometimes you have 50, 100, 200, 300, you know, some many more people living there. So if you have a massive leak in the apartment building, you're not tracking your water bill regularly, and it takes you three months to find that out, and then another month to identify it, and then another month to fix it. By the time you get that, you may have now spent double, triple on your water for those six months and lost all that time because you weren't paying attention to what was happening in the property. So by the time you get this, you've now spent half a year, half that much extra water that's going right down the drain, literally. So you're always going to be looking for ways that you can push the income drivers that can perform with the property in the market, recommendations on expense curtailing, uh, how to facilitate your term process. This goes for us. We're looking at a gold, silver, or bronze package. Traditionally, on most of ours, we're doing either a classic or a premium unit uh, just based on the market and the market need. We try and make this um, rec really something that can be replicated. So... <clears throat> The companies that come in, whether it's going to be the manager company um, handling uh, with in-house construction or them on trades, they don't have to second guess or think about what to do. They already have the SKUs, the, the plan in place of what we expect to have happen if a unit needs to be turned. And this would come down again, as we mentioned earlier, for facilitating lender needs and requests. All right, there we go. Also, account review. Uh, you, you're always looking at your balances, uh, your receivables, your working capital. You, you want to do this because you want to be well ahead to know how your cash position is performing, especially in times when you may be coming up on, on months that, you know, if you're back in March, there was months of uncertainty. So you really want to look at your building, see how you were from a reserve standpoint, see how you were set up, see how your basis was set up to know how you were. But you constantly want to be reviewing this. You want to see how your spending is going, what your performance is going on this. If you're putting um, 5,000 in that unit, is it getting the return on the rents that you're expecting? If you're doing this upgrade, is it, is it having the return on investment that you're anticipating? So for that one, it may be done but you may pivot accordingly on another property in the future, or you may trail back on doing that on additional units or additional parts of the property going forward. Um, you're also looking for upcoming renewals. So what, what can happen on lease renewals? What is the market allowing if for your insurance renewals? What is the market saying? Is there, is there a different um, person we can go out to? How can we look at our contracts? Is our, uh, our contracts coming up for certain things? Maybe we have a, a laundry contract coming up or a pest contract or a, uh, a, um, a dumpster contract that we can look at, renegotiate that with better terms going forward. Constantly keeping the eye on those because uh, vendors will get lazy and just give you upgrades, percentage upgrades on the renewal without actually paying attention to where the market lies because they're just getting comfortable with you as working with them. 
trending. So again, you, there, there's our suggestions, but then there's what the market's doing. And we're not going to fight the biggest player in the market. The biggest player in the market is going to set the trend. and We're going to have to make sure we're in line with that. So if the biggest partner in the, in the market or the biggest player with the most units will not build back in your sub market for utilities, you most likely are going to have a hard time doing it on your property. If the biggest property is allowing people to have pets and not charging them, you may have a difficult time charging for pets. So knowing what the market's doing is going to really give you a full landscape of how you can handle your property, what you can do to perform. On the other scenario, there may be things that your property is missing that you can look at other properties and they're doing, right? They're, they're billing for parking. Um, they have a trash fillet. They're, they're um, charging for pets. Uh, they're doing 15 month leases. You can piggyback on that and have that built into your program to make your uh, property perform better. And then also you're doing uh, reviews with management company. We do ours weekly, depending on your property, the status of your property, the repositioning size of the property it could be monthly. Um, I probably wouldn't say annually, but you know, depending on, on how great the, pro the property is at, maybe, maybe quarterly might be, might be within range, depending on um, how well, um, but I probably still want to be comfortable, comfortable with that. It just depends on you, your worth on what the property entails. Functionality. So you're doing the, the renovation plan, you're, you're repositioning a property. How is your performance against what your goals are? You, you want to look at this from two sides. Are you not meeting your goals? On, on the other side, have you met your goals? And do you need to look at different scenarios for the property based on how your property is performing? You may set out to have a 10-year hold. But if the property is performing so well and the market and the path of progress has taken off um, to such a level in your area, it, would it be best for you to look at disposing of the property at this time for you and for your investors? So you always want to understand where your property sits now because what could come up down the road may not be as great as what you have now. So looking at what your plan was, how your property is performing to that plan, and then pivoting accordingly, whether it be change to get closer to the goal or be that we've hit all of our metrics, we, maybe we should look at selling at this time. Property liaison. So this is communication uh, through with property management and third parties. So many times that you do have to be the facilitator to if there does have to be a lender inspection or it has to be an inspection from insurance or there has to be something else that will come up with the property you will be that person that that middle person that will be setting that up because you might also be driving that as well you may be the person that's setting up to have um, all of those items happen so you're going to be putting the players in place and of course direct contact between ownership and property um, however you may be the ownership So some of the top income drivers, you do want to be looking at your rent increases. Uh, you want to see how your property is performing, uh, where the loss of the lease is. Can you capitalize on many things, right? So can you capitalize on doing some upgrades? So putting in luxury vinyl plank or changing over to stainless appliances or uh, doing other things um, within their change your paint scheme, two-tone paint scheme, uh, changing up all your fixtures, changing up all your light fixtures. Is there things in there that you can do to set the narrative to really maximize on your dollar from the rent, rent perspective? Is additional income warranted in this market? Can you do different things that can provide more income? We talked some like uh, trash relays, some like um, preferred parking, um, some charges for other, other amenities. Contracts on the property can get a uh, can you get a cable contract? We're actually putting a cable contract on two properties right now. Can you um, find a laundry contract that you can benefit from? Can there be a cell tower contract? There's many many forms of additional income that can benefit the property. So looking outside the box to say, okay, what is that? Could you do storage on a property and 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 provide storage to people that um, may be living in an apartment and just need more space? New value adds may warrant additional income and just really cleaning up your tenant process and tenant implementation process will bring value on its own. Adding units is also another one. I've had two properties now where, uh, actually I'll take that back. We've had three properties now where, where a unit was being used as, as an office. Well, if I can find another space, another non-unit space to make the office, which we've had, which we have in all these cases, now we've just gained back three units. 
So now we've just now captured back what another seven hundred, eight hundred dollars in rent uh, over the course of each month. So you're about another ten thousand dollars a year in income. And if you take that and put that to the bottom line, that starts to build dramatically over the course of a five or seven or ten year hold. So top expense savers. These can be management efficiencies. This can be looking at how your property is performing and making sure that you're just running it effectively. Uh, many times um, owners will not take into account, do they have the right number of maintenance people? And they may be either two things, too many maintenance people or where their payroll is uh, very high, or it may be not enough maintenance people and their repairs and maintenance are outside of this world. So understanding what you actually need to do to have the uh, property perform to its best level will be highly beneficial. Looking for economies of scale. If you have a smaller property, so I have a 32 unit property and we actually combine that with neighboring properties that are owned or that are operated by the same management company and, and share a maintenance person and share a leasing person. That helps us because at, the, at our property, we can't basically afford a full-time person, but now we, we're having a full-time person be designated for our few properties in that area where it makes sense. Looking at contract reviews, like we spoke about earlier, utility efficiencies, one of my favorite. Can you go in there and simply just change out uh, original 3.8 gallon toilets for low, low E flush toilets or change out shower heads or faucets and put in uh, um, aerators? And again, tenant training. You, many of your, your expenses get lost in just the ability to uh, make sure tenants are picking up the phone to call you when, when a, a leak's happening. And they've been trained poorly generally when they come in because you've had an ownership prior to you that probably isn't taking care of the property. Probably when someone calls, they don't show up. So the tenant decides that instead of calling because it's so much aggravation for them, they'll just let the water run uh, for months until someone notices it. So train tenants that you're going to go there and make this a better place to live. You're going to go there and make this place a better place for them to be make them know that you want them to pick up the phone and call you when something's wrong because you will come and fix it. Not only will it make the tenant um, happier to live there but it'll, and provide a better experience for that tenant, but it'll also make the property perform so much better for you. All right, so some steps into action. This is the first deal we, we closed. It was uh, back in 2017. Uh, we brought this for 2.3 million. So easy enough, there, there was a lot we, we basically had both sides of, of value adds here. Operational upside was massively below market rents. Um, they were just trying to keep the building full. So they were renting right around $500 a unit where if you had, they based, you had the same type of building right across the street that was renting for $100 and $125 more. So right across the street, fully occupied building, renting for $100 and $125 more. Why? Because they were paying attention to the market and they were pushing and marketing. This building had six vacant units, all of them, uh, pretty much, I think five or six of them rent ready, and they were offering $100 less rent because it was, to them, easier to just keep the building occupied than to have to worry about having more people move out. So again, below market occupancy. The occupancy in this market, I think at the time was 97.2% meaning you had less than 3% vacancy in that market. It was trending like that for the next five years. Um, extremely high expenses. They had, uh, this, this property warrants about a one to uh, one and to some time, one full-time and maybe one part-time maintenance person in the beginning, but basically one full-time maintenance person. Uh, they had four and they were running this because they had a number of single family homes that they were using this as a hub and building this through the property for all these maintenance people. So we purchased this with debt and equity through a syndication. Uh, we used a 7-6 arm through Fannie Mae, and we syndicated and raised about $700,000 on our first deal. Uh, so what can't gone right? We brought on great third-party management. We screened and uh, changed up our collections process. Uh, we turned, at this point, I mean, it was probably about 65 units and completed all of our required lender pairs in five months. So we really pushed to get things happening quickly. One of the key things here is we offered a tenant referral program because we knew if we made this a better community to live, made people happier, and were able to get people to refer their friends, they were going to stay longer. Because generally one of your biggest expenses is, of course, having to turn a unit and the time it takes to get that unit leased. So the time you're vacant. 
We implemented a move-in fee in lieu of a deposit that goes directly to our bottom line and installed a water savings plan that cut our water bill by almost 20, 30%. Basically, we trained tenants to call us when the water was running. We changed faucets to aerators and we uh, changed out all the original toilets to low flush toilets. That 30% savings uh, added about 325,000 of value to the building. And then we put pet fees in. Um, they said no pets and they had six units with pets. So it was one of those points. They already had the pets. They weren't billing for them, nor were they checking for them. So we just went with the market said. The market said, I think it's a uh, $300 non-refundable pet fee and $25 a month of pet. Perfect. Implemented. More things. So we actually helped clean up the neighborhood by calling the police department and allowing them to use one of our units uh, to stake out a neighboring building that was the trouble building on the block. The neighboring building was owned by the city, causing trouble, had a lot of people that did not even live there staying there and it was making our tents feel unsafe so we really took over one of our units and put and put it down just so a person could come in there so one of the detectives could use that and they were able to arrest a bunch of people and again make this a better community to live as we go back to increased rents above performer rents so we said we were looking to capture anywhere between 100 to 125 and i think we were at the end uh, capturing about 155 a uh, unit uh, so after year one was able to refinance the property and return over 75% of capital to investors well ahead of schedule. And this was months ago, we actually sold this property, even though this was a seven year hold, we sold this property because the market had trended path of progress had taken a great turn into this neighborhood. And it turned out that this was an astronomically great time for our investors here that if we could sell now. So we went out there, targeted the market, had about six offers, chose uh, the strongest offer and was able to close this property and give massive returns to our investors. So that's us right there. You can go find me uh, at University Holdings or, or Jason University over there at Instagram. Um, feel free to, to go here if you want to talk about investing with us and invest with University. But ultimately it came down that we got into this property by just seeing what other people were doing, how are they doing it, and started following the steps one step at a time. And that led us to get this now to the point that we've done maybe about 10, 10 syndications at this point. If I just count them up and uh, currently in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Georgia, Texas, and soon to be Tennessee. So noting that we just follow people's steps, we put, put the plan into action. We took action. We had the right people around us to be able to set up the scenario that we knew the direction to go. And when we got off track, we were able to ask questions to get ourselves quickly back onto the, the, the road. All right, guys. Great. Thank you, Jason, for that. That was really, really um, inf uh, informational and uh, very insightful. Um, so if anything, my biggest takeaway from this was that uh, asset management is an ongoing process, that it's not done when you acquire the building. It's an ongoing uh, process that you follow throughout the life of the asset. You're constantly asking yourself how you can make the property better, how you can better serve the residents, and by doing so, how you can increase the profitability of the asset. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think we have one question here from uh, the audience. Uh, Jerry said, what was the average rent on the 94 unit in Louisville? At purchase, it was uh, the effect it was under $500. It was something like, um, it's been a couple of years now, but it's something like $475 or $80. So, so that was just purely on a point here where uh, the owner had passed away. It actually built he had, uh, and I, some of you guys have heard before, but he had five or six kids. I'm forgetting now. None of them lived in the state. They had, um, were also, once he passed, he had a thousand single family homes in his one large building. And for some reason, they thought the single family homes, because they, they lived in a home, so they understood that better. That was going to be easier for them to take on. So they wanted to get rid of this apartment building they thought was really just causing chaos for them. But where the chaos was, was they just weren't putting any attention to it. So we were able to go in there and just give it attention. And it quickly was able to just really meet the market and capitalize. That's great. And that perfectly illustrates the idea of, you know, one man's trash, or in this case, headaches is another man's treasure. And that you were able to go in and, and you know, input some of these uh, changes and create value on the bottom line. Um, to that point, um, you know, you were saying that you have weekly meetings with your property manager um, as, as the asset manager. You set the strategy and monitor uh, progress with the property manager on those weekly calls. 
What are some KPIs that you use um, to kind of monitor and measure whether you're performing? So we, we uh, I'll start with the call, right? We, we do the call in, in three segments. Uh, the call is basically is going to be construction, uh, collections, leasing. And those are going to be our points right here of cont- just because um, everybody comes out in the beginning. So all the construction management person as well. So we'll have them just to get them off the phone quickest in the beginning. We'll do that first if there's any parts, whether it be from a CapEx perspective or it's going to be from um, a, a term perspective. There might be two different people depending on, on the company. So we're going to sp- split the call up into those categories right there. When we get in there, we're going to look again. Um, some, of the, some of the indicators we're looking at, we're looking at really our leases. How many leases are coming up in the next month? And how can we circumvent it or correct something that's going forward in the future? So say you take over a property and in December, it's got 20 leases renewed. Okay, so if you're a 60 unit property, that's 33% of your tenant base could potentially walk out the door. So what can we do to, to look at that scenario and hope to change that scenario going forward. Well, maybe we'll offer some uh, 12, 14, and 16 month lease options here, or maybe we'll do some 10, 12, and 14 lease uh, month lease options here. So we can start staggering those leases out. So we're gonna look at that from a perspective right here. Um, We're looking at our vacancy numbers to see how we're trending against the market. We're looking how quickly our units are turning based on the market, because that's gonna tell us, are we um, not being bullish with marketing? Or are we looking to get too much rent, right? We, we don't want to have the units sit there just to capture another $10, but sit there for a whole month where we've lost that for three years and the amount of money we could have, could have gotten right there. So we're always tracking what the indicators are coming from the market and how our pro- property is performing leading into that. Great. Thanks for laying that out. Um, so Adam has a question here about how did you find this deal? Because this does seem like kind of the ideal um, deal uh, for as far as uh, going in and being able to um, take a distressed or maybe undermanaged, underperforming asset and uh, both increase the top line and maybe find some efficiencies in the cost structure. So how were you able to track this down? Uh, patience. And, and it's simply that. So the original asking price of this was three point two million. And we brought this in May of 2017. We first offered on this, if I'm correct, in November of 2016. And we offered 2.1 million. And the owner said, you guys are nuts, 3.2 million. Even though we had a scenario, we had the reason because it was worth literally what we offered, right? So time goes by, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. They're probably getting these two two million numbers because that's what the property's worth. They're not getting that three point two number, but everybody keeps getting that offer back from the owner. Just three point two million. That's what we want because that's that's what it's worth, right? So you keep having that happen and having that happen. Eventually, people stop offering that number because they the ownership is unrealistic. Well, maybe ownership starts to be realistic because time changes everything. So we come in there months later, we notice that it's it's basically off the market now. It's not being listed. It's just out there in the, the abyss. We ask what's going on. Will they accept another offer? And they would. So we actually, they wanted again, 3.2 million. We originally offered 2.1 million. We came in and said, okay, we offered 50,000 more than our original offer. So now we've only come up 50,000. We're still over a million dollars off on the asking. But they went and within, I think, three hours, came back to us with a counter that was 2.6 million because time cures everything. So we knew that now they had a different motivation. They had a different understanding with what their property was worth. And throughout the next couple of weeks, we're able to negotiate it. And uh, I think our max offer was 2.4 that we could get to before we, we were going to walk. And we were able to get it for 2.3 million after some nego- negotiations back and forth there. But it was just tracking old deals seeing what's happening with them. Same thing that's happening now, right? People are asking for, you know, still crazy numbers and they might get it, they might not. But if they're motivated, they're going to come to their senses or they're not going to sell. Perfect. So patience and persistence won the day there. Um, Dan had a question kind of in line with what you were just saying about um, people offering crazy numbers. He's asking, uh, how's pricing looking in the Louisville market now? Are there COVID discounts or are people still asking for unicorn numbers? Awesome. Hey, Dan. Uh, so 
I, I'm, I'm going to guess you're asking, you're, you're thinking about, um, so buying properties. Um, it's, it's a mix of both, right? So there, I have not seen discounts out there, but people are still asking aggressive numbers, um, actually very aggressive numbers. And some are getting it, right? Some, some are getting numbers out there that um, I, I have to remember to think of it um, from the perspective of where the market lies, because I, I think um, Jerome Powell said we're not going to have um, interest rates hike up for another couple of years right now. Some of these other points that are still going to drive the market and interest rates are so low on debt. So some people are looking at this, you know, I get 10 year term loan for under 3%, right? Um, so looking at that perspective, people have been very aggressive. They're buying and sellers are out there pushing it. So I, I've not really seen many discounts. Um, I, I, there's been a couple of properties that were in trouble prior to COVID and they're selling now, but they were in trouble before. So that wasn't really a discount. They were just in trouble before and they were in trouble now. Um, but we still got a long runway here. So I'm sure some of that fallout will come eventually. Okay, great. Now, in terms of um, uh, technology and tools um, that you use on the asset management side, um, you know, a lot of this seems, it seems like you're, you're um, you know, communicating with the lenders, uh, you're keeping on top of contracts, you're tracking P&L. What are some maybe organizational tools or um, just some things to make sure that you're managing uh, the asset management side of the business uh, most effectively? Uh, so I have a VA and she cc it on the email and we use Asana. And every Wednesday before I start having a property management call, she'll send me a full update of all open items across all properties. So I can go into the calls knowing what, what topics have been missed, what emails haven't been followed up on, what, um, what points are, are out there or what, you know, what tasks are coming up due. So keeping it simple in that mind, um, I don't jump into the property management software. So typically, um, and then also the other one is I use, uh, I'm actually just transitioning over to Investnext um, for a investor portal. And so we're using it as an investor portal. Maybe we'll talk on the next call, Mark, um, about Investnext. It's pretty cool um, just to get it um, a little more user friendly for investors. So I I'm pretty much have that set up to get ready to launch. But that will be a new series as well. We'll be able to make it a one stop shop because I can send out all updates from there. I can send out blogs from there. I can send out ECHs up there. I can put in all of our tax items in there. Can allow in um, allow investors there. They all will have access to the portal, so they can go in there and track all their investments and see how their metrics are doing for each deal. That is cool. I use Investnext cool. too, actually. Do you? Nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. There does seem to be um, there do seem to be a few different companies going into this space, which is encouraging um, to 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 try to create um, better communication, I guess, um, between yeah. all parties. Um, so that's really encouraging to see. Um, so yeah, definitely um, interesting. Uh, and I'll, I'll follow up um, with you on that. Um, now, uh, switching gears a little bit, you mentioned that throughout the life cycle of the investment, you know, you're constantly seeing and and kind of probing the market and seeing what you can do better. I'm just wondering how you stay up to speed on the competition. Is it via the property manager? Do you do kind of mystery shopping or how are you just keeping abreast of what's going on elsewhere? It's a both. It's a, it's a constant conversation and you're constantly looking. And I mean, there's simple things where you can just one, be in town, you know, if you're in town, you know, two, um, beyond that. So I, I, I didn't mention, I have another person who's, um, I, I hired a person who's boots on the ground there that I'll have go by the properties uh, once a week. Just they'll walk vacants. Uh, they'll make sure the properties, and this is a proper person that's hired right through us. This is not someone who works for a property management company. Go out there, make sure the properties you know are looking good. They're you know they're they're looking clean. They, they're showing well. Um, seeing that renovations, um, where the unit is, how how bad the vacant is, where the term progress is, right? So it's checks and balances. Um, but getting back to ultimately for um, the, the question, it was on, it was on uh, property management or just. Yeah, just um, overall in terms of how do you um, stay abreast of what's going on in the market um, as far as your competition and, and otherwise? You, there's many sites. You know, you can go on there from Rentometer to Apartments.com. Um, honestly, just or even Secret Shopping that you can constantly. And it, this doesn't have to be a point, but you do want to see where rents are going because if you're looking to push rents, you want to see who's your competition. What are they doing? Are they getting those rents? Are they getting? The, are they having to offer concessions? And if you can look at that from that, that point, you can know where you fall and how you feel your property stacks up against that property. 
Awesome, awesome. So Tay has a question about COVID-19. So he says, did COVID lead you to, to re-engineer any of your strategies and the way in which you cater to tenants' needs? Yeah, hey Tay, um, so good question. Um, at first we did nothing different because I didn't feel like I had enough data to just go off the deep end. Like I felt like I was gonna start cutting my toes off if I just needed a Band-Aid. Um, cause I just didn't know where, where to go. But what we did do is we stopped CapEx on project on properties that were not necessary CapEx. Um, so it's simple things that, that didn't have to be done right now. We put them on hold. Uh, we've since resumed them, but at that point we stopped. We also stopped doing any repairs inside units, uh, just to keep uh, social distancing. So we weren't impacting tenants, um, unless they were emergency repairs. We also, uh, really up the communication with the tenants. And that, that was huge because just with anything from them to be able to file for assistance or anything else for coming to that point, we learned quickly that um, some tenants that because they couldn't leave and they, they were quarantined or whatever the point or they, they were in, they, they didn't have access to, to simple, something simple as internet. I, I would have never known, but some of the older people didn't. So we were able to open up the office, provide social distancing so they could go in there and, and file for their assistance. But that was something that, I would have never thought to ask if property management company wasn't uh, keeping a really um, high level of communication with the tenants to see how they're doing, to see how they're performing, to see what's changing in their life. Because that that's that step, right? The, again, it is all people here. So the more you can make this a communication level to see what they're doing, what they need help with, and the more it's going to help you and help your investors. Makes total sense. Yeah, uh, this is something I, th I think about a lot um, during COVID is, um, you know, this to me, it, it seems like something that rock star operators like yourself really look forward to because it's an opportunity for you to distance yourselves from the competition and the way that uh, you treat tenants and that you um, ultimately operate the assets. So it seems like uh, something where it's really an opp opportunity for you to double down on, on some asset management that you are already doing. Um, yeah, we sold so, rents a little bit too. We, we were about to do a rent increase across the building. We've since uh, resumed that, but at that stage, we said it's it it with with the un unknown at that point. We said, okay, it's better to have heads and beds than to be vacant, because we didn't know how quickly we quickly learned that leasing was massively strong. So even, regardless throughout, leasing was really strong. Still is. So we we started to be more bullish with going back to the rent increases. Yeah, quick question, Jason, on that portion regarding the um, leasing was strong. Is that also kind of like uh, underscores kind of like the area that, that choosing to invest in kind of underscores that that when times are tough in maybe other areas of the countries, the area that you've chosen to invest in is, is, is a, you know, a home run. You know, Basically. potentially, right? It, it's going to go to the market, going to go. I mean, there's going to be areas like um, some suburban areas are going to really start to see a big push, right? You're going to see some markets that are going to be start a big push. Um, but, and then some of it is is potentially luck, right? So I, I probably would have never put so much of an emphasis on, um, on having um, people working in hotels or people working in restaurants living in my building. Um, we, we always like to have a very diverse you know, employment group in our, in our buildings, but I would have never like thought that that would have been an area that, that would really just get shut off. Right. But, but I do know buildings that are in Louisville, um, that live, you know, that are downtown that have a lot of service, um, you know, like hospitality workers that live there that are really hurting right now because those people are all really cut out hours or no hours or reduced money. So, so knowing your sub market, knowing where, the lack of housing is so the new one the new deal in, in uh murfreesboro the the cool thing about that is if you look at it from a perspective here there's actually a moratorium on uh, multifamily being built so right now the city is saying okay no more multifamily but what's fighting that trend is they don't have enough housing so so right now you see they're not allowing multifamily maybe they want single family but then you have a group of people that maybe just can't can't they, they either don't want to or they can't afford you know to be to be a home buyer and that that's a renter pool and when you look at that renter pool there's not enough rental housing for you so if you can provide good rental housing in a market that's crunch for housing well it leads you to a point here where people are going to really push because they're going to want a place to live totally we could probably have a whole episode on the uh supply demand fundamentals of, of multifamily and why it's the asset class to be in for the next five to 10 years, but uh, that would probably take another another few hours here. 
Um, definitely appreciate it, Jason. Uh, seems like we're out of questions so far, um, but appreciate your time tonight. You laid out a lot of really good actionable kind of steps that we can take away and learn from. Um, so thank you again for your time. And for anybody, um, oh, you know what? Uh, before I speak, it looks like we have one last question here. Sorry. Uh, are you the asset manager on all the syndications that you invest in? If so, what important systems, processes, hires have you implemented to help manage your time? I'm yeah, good question. One. So Asana is one of them, right? So you're not just, so you have a lot of tra uh, checks and balances and then making sure that people on the team, um, like uh, Jacob, who's their boots in the ground and Patricia, who is my VA um, and my wife, Peely, who helps with investor relations. So on that front, having the right people so we can all focus on the right parts. Because sometimes we get so in the weeds doing a lot of things that potentially aren't our job or shouldn't be our job when we really need to have the other allow the other people to do what they're really fluent in that they're best served to do um in my asset management syndication uh probably about 85 percent what i say um it, it depends on on how i'm brought into the partnership um but about 85 percent of them i am um but i do prefer to and at some point, you know, you, you, you want to make sure that you're being really fluent in your process, because if you're doing all these things on all roles like we just talked about, you're almost canceling yourself out because there's not enough of you. So making sure you have checks and balances, you have the right team around you. Um, so going into Murfreesboro, we got a great team there. I got a lot of people that are actually in market. So we're going to have I'm going to do asset management. And I'm going to have all the people there to be the checks and balances, have that in Kentucky, have that in Pennsylvania, have those in those areas because it allows you to really push the narrative. And then have other people to make sure to, to do the checks so you can pivot accordingly. Awesome. So specialize, 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 have a team in place, have someone with this specialization on your team. If you're not an asset manager, uh, say extraordinaire, uh, then have somebody like Jason um, on your next deal that you can uh, take this on and really knock it out of the park. Um, yeah, remember, you, you, you can get into deals many different ways. You can be a partner in the deal in a lot of different ways. So it's, it's what you can really bring your best value to. Absolutely. And I think this is a part of the business that does, unfortunately doesn't get as much attention. Um, you know, there aren't as many uh, sexy Instagram pics of people uh, doing asset management, their weekly calls with property managers. But, um, but that being said, this is somewhere where you can definitely differentiate yourselves and differentiate your performance on your investments. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank you. Um, anybody who wants to reach out to Jason, his contact information is there. Um, and we will provide a replay of this webinar uh, later tomorrow as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you Jason. Have a great night, everybody. Have a great night.